And I would like actually uh, to welcome our next moderator to start the next panel. And if we find the time, we'll during the, the, the panel or after it, we'll show another video with the migrant story. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Angelica Broman, and I am the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus Advisor at IOM in Geneva. It's a great honor to be here with you and moderate the panel called Examining the Linkage Between Migration, Environment and Climate Change to the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus. And as you all know, IOM adheres to the OECDAC recommendations on the HDPN, which um, fits very well with our mandate. We work within all the three sectors. We are a triple mandated organization, and it's a great pleasure to see, and we always look on how we can integrate environment and climate change better into our operations. As mentioned, we have a panel of seven distinguished person. And I think I'll do, I won't introduce all the seven at once. I will start with the first speaker and let that person give a short presentation and then go on to the next uh, due to shortage of time. So with no further ado, and as mentioned, you can put questions during the presentations in the chat and we will make sure that they are responded to. So the first panelist today is Mr. Just uh, Clarenbeck. And I also want to apologize in advance if I mispronounce um, any person's name. Mr. Clarenbeck is a special envoy for migration from the Netherlands. And as ambassador at large, he's worked with governments, international organization and civil society to foster dialogue with countries of origin and transit. He's currently chairing the EU Horn of Africa Migration Dialogue, the Khartoum process, and he's going to talk and give some perspectives from the Netherlands on this issue. So over to you. Thank you very much, um, Angelica. And um, well, many speakers have already said it both yesterday and today, but you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has left some very deep impacts and inequalities. So there is an increased political urgency to act based as usual, no longer possible. And therefore, this international dialogue on migration, focusing on migration, the environment, and climate change, is most timely and urgent. And a big thank you to IMM for, um, for organizing this. The, the urgency to act now is reflected in the disturbing and growing figures on global force displacement. If you look at the year 2019, for instance, almost 2,000 weather-related disasters triggered 25 million new displacements across 140 countries and territories. Now, this is the highest figure recorded in a decade. And most important of all, these are three times the number of displacements caused by conflicts and violence, three times. Climate change is happening as we speak, and it is already affecting the lives of people in multiple ways, in terms of food security, floods, droughts, pushing more than 100 million people below the poverty line in the coming years, and further driving migration as well. And Africa is perhaps the continent most at risk here in the sense of driving forced migration as a result of climate change. The number of people on the move due to climate change related factors will increase strongly over the coming years. According to the African Union, future climate change may cause armed conflict in over 20 African countries and political unrest in maybe 30 other countries. And of course, we need to realize that over 75% of the African population is under the age of 35. Therefore, it is important to listen very closely to what youth have to say. African youth may become climate leaders or they may become displaced and we have a choice to help you. To address this urgency to act, the Netherlands organized and hosted the first Global Climate Adaptation Summit last January to share knowledge, lessons learned, and how to adapt to climate change. And we learned that an investment of, well, maybe $2 trillion in climate adaptation could deliver over $7 trillion in benefit. Investing in climate adaptation could add up to maybe 0.7 extra economic growth globally. So climate adaptation is the right thing to do. And it is also the smart thing to do. 
we need to start putting this at the heart of social economic recovery from COVID-19. We in the Netherlands see climate as a fundamental risk to economic and financial stability. And we see climate action as an opportunity to reinvigorate growth after the pandemic and create new green jobs. For us, this is mission critical. And ambition, therefore, will be the word this year, also on the road to COP26. Water, agriculture, economic growth are most affected by climate change, but there are also hugely important pillars for building back. And from the global pandemic and lessons learned over the past year, one quality shines through, and which is the power of global collaboration and partnership. Climate partnerships at all levels are important. We need to link local, national, and global levels for adaptation, strengthen meaningful inclusion in climate decision-making processes, and increase involvement of a wide range of actors in putting adaptation solutions into practice. And as I said, do involve youth and do involve women. Humanitarian development and peace-building actors must work together to find durable and efficient solutions in the context of climate change and environmental disasters. And this calls for an integrated approach, a new way of working. And in this context, we very much appreciate IOM's initiative and efforts to foster greater cooperation and to enhance cross-sectoral partnerships that concretely address the increasingly complex interconnected migration challenges of today. Now, the pandemic has shown us once more the importance of localization, the need to reduce vulnerabilities of societies, protecting them against shocks. And we need to leverage our collective knowledge, learn from ongoing initiatives, share lessons learned, do joint analysis on risks and how to promote durable solutions, and thus also tackling root causes of irregular and forced migration. As our Prime Minister said last year when the um, the year of the pandemic restarted. You know, let this not be the year that triggered a lost decade for development and for building a climate resilient world. Emergency response and recovery packages must be aligned with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And this means we must incorporate incentives to accelerate transformation towards economic recovery powered by low carbon infrastructure, green jobs, and resilient livelihoods. As the cliche goes, building back better is the only way forward. So in summary, three points. One, climate can be a risk, is a risk to economic and financial stability and security. But climate adaptation and mitigation is also an opportunity for reinvigorating growth after the pandemic. Second point, we do need global cooperation and partnerships at all levels, link local, national and global, strengthen meaningful inclusion, especially for women and youth, in climate decision-making processes. And third, we need to leverage this collective knowledge, learn from ongoing initiatives, share lessons learned, do joint analysis, and promote durable solutions. The COVID-19 pandemic has further increased the urgency to act, and while doing this, we also help tackle the root causes of irregular and forced migration and displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. And I said, I think you covered a lot of what um, the HDPN is about localization, putting people first, participatory approach, etc. But we're now going to hand over to Ms. Grata Enda Vadingintayas. I am very sorry for the pronunciation. Ambassador, Permanent Mission of Indonesia to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. Her Excellency will highlight Indonesia's national experience and best practice for regarding climate-induced mobility and disaster risk reduction, especially from the perspective of the global compact for migration, where they are a champion country. Are you online? I can't see you. Please. Take yes, I am online. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> Great. Over to you then. Uh, uh, thank you, Angelita for, Angelica, for giving me the time. Now, before I touch upon the specific question addressed to me, I would like to start with some statistics to give you uh, a context regarding Indonesia, where we are coming from. First, in the Asia-Pacific region alone, the number of international migrants, according to the UNSCAP, reached 
65 million in 2019. Now, 65 million equal a quarter of the world international migrant that reached almost 300 in 2019. And 65 million is almost equal to the total population of France in 2020. Just to give you the perspective. But more importantly, this number is only represent one side of the story, the regular documented migrant. We haven't even talking about the irregular one. We do not have sufficient data to portray the irregular one, which I believe will, could be much more significant in number. Uh, the other thing is UNHCR uh, noted that eight out of the most 10 countries that hit hardest by conflict are among those also exposed to climate hazard. And these eight countries among 10 host nearly 20 million displaced persons fleeing from violence, conflict and persecution. Now, statistics and events also show that people are motivated to migrate for a number of reasons that many of the panel has already said, it includes economic, political, environmental, and climate industrization. And all this motivation may also be compounded and interrelated. So migration is an undeniable reality. But let me just bring another understanding that the fact migration is part of human existence. It has been ever happening in the earliest recorded history of mankind. Many human civilization, economic growth in the past were created or driven by migration. And even all the push factors that most uh, uh, colleague panel has already mentioned, including the environmental and climate industries, and it's also caused the, the migration many centuries ago. However, of course, the current geopolitical political situation. Now we are start marking up lines, uh, 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 territory between country makes the situation much, much complex. Then of course, uh, for Indonesia, we also understand that it is important that migration policy focus on tackling the root causes. Uh, some of them like uh, people consider a, a more uh, preventable causes, but it is also a long-term solution. So for country like Indonesia, it is more possible and realistic for us to combine preventive measure with improvement of our current ma migration management. This is to ensure that when migration happens, then it will happen, it's happening, it will conduct it in a safe, orderly and regular manner. So a comprehensive approach. Now back to the question at hand, over decades, Indonesia have learned so much from our various experience in responding to domestic climate and natural disaster induced displacement and irregular movement of people. We are a country of 17,000 islands. So can you imagine that? And at least there are three lessons learned that we can share in, in, uh, in the connection of nexus between humanitarian development and peace and migration. First is the need to build a domestic capabilities. Now we learn firsthand the importance of having holistic approach on disaster risk reduction. As a country located in the ring of fire, Indonesia is disaster prone. In 2020 alone, yeah, we already have more than 1,300 disaster occurrence and have already more than 5.1 million people displaced. Now, again, this backdrop, our government for uh, several years now has shifted the focus from disaster risk, uh, disaster response mechanism to disaster risk management and supported by, uh, by a more comprehensive policy framework. Of course, we're taking into account the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And we also continue to build a better uh, and fit for purpose disaster management institution at the national and subnational. Uh, we have uh, Indonesian National Board for Disaster Management at the central governments, but it also has affiliate office at the provincial and district level. So at the national level, we will focus on improving institutional and policies coordination with other agencies at the national level, but also in terms of allocation resources. Just remember, we are talking about 17,000 uh, uh, islands of country with 70,000 island of islands. So allocation of resources is important. How we are making sure that the resources that we have are uh, able to move quickly to address disasters on the other part of our country. At the local, we focus on enhancing uh, disaster response by focusing on the efficiency and efficacy in aid management and aid delivery system. Now we want, uh, I think one of the lessons from uh, many uh, the disasters that we have and 
how we are, you know, managing uh, uh, help and assistance from other countries. We want to make sure that all program and disaster relief assistance that we receive prioritize the local community interest and not donor driven. Sometimes we have uh, received uh, assistance that are not actually uh, practical to, to be used at the local level, for example. So it's a, uh, another waste of resources. And second, a regional approach is often uh, a more a tailor-made solution for us. No data shows that most migration happen between countries of the same region. So hence regional approach, uh, approach uh, fits better because neighbors know best. <laughs> now allow me to share our experience in establishing the Bali process with uh, Australia in 2002 to address the issue of irregular migration in the region. Now Bali process have more than 49 uh, countries. It was uh, in the beginning a consultative process, bring uh, 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 countries uh, of origin, transit, as well as destination. Now most of our members are countries coming from the region, but also we have member coming from different region, but this member are an important key player in the migration issue. We also include different uh, UN agency and international organization. So in the beginning, the forum is uh, uh, another platform for uh, information sharing and best practices. But then Andaman Sea crisis happening in 2015. And after that, we experienced in the region subsequent cases of irregular maritime migration. And uh, this crisis is another example how Bali process as a regional forum has to adapt its working method. Now, the crisis in 2015 shows that Bali process need to build a more agile and timely response for sudden and large influx of migration. So we are no longer a forum for talk shop and sharing best experience. We have to establish something to respond quickly. So Bali process established what we call the task force on planning and preparedness. It comprises of operational level government officials who are responsible at the national level dealing with transport that large movement of migrants and refugees. So <clears throat> through the task force, uh, Bali process tried to create another arm to have a stronger action oriented and in field, in field coordination where communication has to be built among countries in the region from early warning, especially detection of movement of ship carrying uh, people on boat, you know, uh, boat peoples and uh, uh, coordination for search and rescue that sometimes need different country who share maritime uh, border to work together. And we talk about uh, capacity and uh, uh, how to uh, help each other in terms of in disembarkment and management of shelter for these uh, people that we rescue. And uh, st starting last year, because of the pandemic, we also built capacity in responding to this crisis while still adhering to the strict uh, health protocol. We need to protect not only our uh, worker and official at the front line that provide help to the rescue migrant, but we need to make sure the rescue migrants are safe from the COVID. Now, between 2020 and 2021, we have rescued more than um, uh, almost uh, almost 40, 400 Rohingya board people. Majority are women and children. And for Indonesia, it's it's actually a commitment from us to provide assistance and protection, although we are not a party to the 1915 Refugee Convention. The other thing is Bali process has also taught us that first, regional uh, management of migrant means we also need to work in dealing with the element of transnational uh, crimes, like human trafficking and people smuggling, because these crimes preys on the vulnerability of migrant that is as that desperate to escape their situation in their home countries. The, more, the other important thing is uh, it's important to work with other resourceful countries, uh, particularly the state party to the 1915 uh, convention. Not only resources countries have more uh, uh, role in contribution for the funding, but also in accelerating the safe, voluntary and dignified, and of course, resettlement of migrants in our region. 
to outside of uh, Asia Pacific region. Now, the third one is uh, multilateral governance such as GCM. We find GCM, it's really helpful. He has been served as guide for Indonesia to improve our migration governance. For example, the most important thing is for us to identify some of the gaps and missing lead related to the cross-sectoral challenge of migration. In short, JCM has helped us to build a more coordinated migration governance and also help us in the process of developing national action plan. Uh, uh, at the moment, we are uh, doing the national action plan to further implement GCM with the principle of whole government and whole society approach. Now, according to the GCM, uh, there is also a notion that we need to minimize the driver that force people to leave their countries. Yes, we have already agreed on that. But also we need to work towards a world where migration is, is a more a genuine choice, not a necessity. And if this become a genuine choice, then according to GCM, it is also our job to ensure the choice is conducted in safe and orderly manner. On, on the last note, you'd like to touch upon the impact of pandemic on migration. Uh, during the pandemic, we've seen that many countries, including myself, uh, our countries, uh, started to looking inward. And most are struggling to cushion the impact of COVID-19 to the social economic welfare of their people. Uh, uh, and we want to make sure that our people get vaccinated as soon as possible. So it is a difficult time for any country to provide health support and protection for their own citizen. We're not even mentioning health support and protection to the irregular migrant that we are hosting. So can you imagine even those, pro this, this is even a problem for uh, uh, low, high income country. Can you imagine the challenge for low and uh, uh, middle income countries with the minimum resources? But at the same time, the reality, they are the one who do the heaviest listing, lifting in immigration because they host the majority of irregular migrants in the world. So therefore, um, uh, just to uh, underline the importance of principle of burden sharing and responsibility sharing, it's not just a rhetoric, but also observe and implement it, particularly during difficult times, such, such as the time of the pandemic. I think that's it for me. And thank you again for your time and listening. So I'm looking forward to hear the views and perspective from other panelists and, of course, uh, the question. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you very much. That's exactly what, I mean, you said it all, really, the Sendai framework, the heart of HDPN is coordinating, coordinating and enhancing domestic and local capacity. We will probably hear from all of you back at the end of this session, because we will open up for questions and answers. But now with no further ado, it's a great honor for me to present Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Dameri, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Person, who will talk about IDPs, human rights, and um, slow onset dimension. Is that with no further ado, uh, and after Ms. Jimenez, we will have General Anciet, if that's okay with you. I see you're on also. Go ahead, Ms. Cecilia. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, actually, good evening to where I'm coming from with uh, very many thanks for the kind invitation of IOM to contribute to the, this first dialogue on migration and specifically to this panel. So let me add to the spectrum, the wide spectrum of migration by raising an important and urgent issue that is forced displacement in the context of climate change, which has already been um, uh, attributed uh, by other speakers. Human mobility, in the context of climate change and specifically on slow onset adverse effects of climate change can take many forms, including displacement, 
migration, and planned relocation. In most cases, movement is not entirely voluntary or forced. I think in the previous panel, one of the speakers pointed out that sometimes there is a very, very um, thin line between forced migration, forced displacement, and migration. But rather, sometimes it even falls somewhere in the continuum between the two, with different degrees of voluntariness and constraint. However, in line with the definition of the guiding principles on internal displacement, internal displacement is considered to take place when people are evacuated or flee their homes or places of, of habitual residence, whether to avoid the anticipated effects of a disaster or to remain uh, or, or in the aftermath of a disaster and remain within the country's borders. And so it is within this context that I have been asked to share with you my last report to the General Assembly, which focused on the particular challenges posed by internal displacement in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change, as well as its impacts on the enjoyment of human rights of those affected. As defined by the UN FCCC, slow onset Events are events that evolve gradually from incremental changes occurring over many years or from an increased frequency or intensity of recurring events. And that sounds so familiar to all of us. It is very telling that while just some attention has been brought to the human rights challenges resulting from certain types of slow onset disaster displacement, most of the attention has been focused on sudden onset disaster displacement. The human rights implications are both ongoing in all types of disaster displacement, current going on now, as well as generational with much of the effects in the future and in our children and our children's children, quite irreversible. So given this context, we have analyzed in my reports that practically all the human rights of the displaced, as well as non-displaced persons, are actually affected in the risk of violations to these human rights increase in, with both time, intensity, as well as frequency of the effects of climate change. And nevertheless, between displaced and non-displaced populations, the differences of the levels of risks and actual violations of human rights actually grow wider and graver over time. Displaced populations having the most, have the most burden of these risk to human rights violations. In addition, within the vast populations of internally displaced persons affected, we likewise need to ensure um, to, to examine and address the particularities of the impacts of climate change on the human rights of specific groups, such as indigenous peoples, pastoralists, women, children and young persons, the elderly and persons with disabilities as well, just to name a few. It is particularly in relation not only to IDPs generally, but to specific groups, that the aspect of loss and damages comes in very succinctly. For example, much of the loss in IDP situations are not actually considered classically loss and damage. Talk about, for example, the loss of culture and language caused by the displacement in indigenous peoples, the loss of traditional livelihoods brought about by damages to land and waters as experienced by persons with special attachment to the lands, and also to the loss and damages of ways of life and the knowledge that this imbibes. This year, the anniversary of the, F of the UN FCCC, it would be incumbent on us to reflect on the so-called unseen, non-material loss and damages that are the result of the adverse effects of climate change brought about by forced displacement. Having said this, however, the only way forward is to ensure that such groups, instead of merely being seen as vulnerable, which is the prevalent view in many of our circles, they should be seen as agents of positive change and agency. It is therefore 
therefore um, incumbent us to facilitate in our respective areas of responsibility in this wide spectrum of migration that the, uh, the, the, the setting up, the establishment uh, of conditions that would enable what I call the agency approach. Indeed, in this vein, my mandate has always, always emphasized that the participation of internally displaced persons and other affected people like migrants in decisions affecting them is very essential and is actually a matter of good governance on the part of the authorities. And this is an essential approach to protect the rights of internally displaced persons. My report concludes by reiterating, in fact, the primary responsibility of states to prevent and reduce the risks attributed to such effects of climate change. And we have heard many uh, examples already in this, in this panel, which is very heartening to me. But with the fundamental need, I would like to insist, there is a fundamental need to adopt a human rights and IDP displaced affected person centered approach and response to prevention, protection and solutions. Parallel to the spotlight of state obligations, which is um, an attribute of the primary responsibility of states, an attribute of uh, sovereignty. I stress the importance, of course, of a consolidated and coordinated solidarity approach, an action-oriented approach of the international community to tackle this present situation. In some addressing internal displacement as in the, in the wide spectrum of migration, within the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change requires a holistic approach to the complexities and multi-causality of human mobility in this context. It therefore requires both individual and joint action by affected states, multilateralism, and the international community with the IDPs and affected communities themselves. And of course, a multi-stakeholder coordinated approach to climate action, disaster risk reduction, development, peace, human rights protection. It would also be essential to involve peace actors in this in settings where such climate change related um, effects interact with armed conflict. This is the reality we have in many countries. And on the ground, the approach requires other actors, other actors as well. For example, business, civil society, national human rights institutions, and other act, independent actors, as well as the academia. Last but certainly not the least, the participation of internally displaced persons, migrants, etc., as required by the human right of political participation and reiterated by many international instruments, including the guiding principles on internal displacement. In addition to my mandates expert independent report to the General Assembly, which I have just shared with you, and my recommendations I hope that um, the, uh, the recommendations are taken on board and, and I, I know that some states have taken them on board, uh, but also to be taken on board by the international community. I also very much hope that the high level panel uh, of the Secretary General for Solutions to Internal Displacement, which includes disaster displacement, will take a consolidated approach to disaster risk reduction, development and human rights protection, without which, Solutions to situations of displacement caused by the effects of climate change cannot be achieved. I would like to conclude by thanking IOM for its valuable contribution to my GA report last year, which I have shared with you just now. And uh, IOM's inputs have much enhanced the perspectives and substance of the analysis of my report. And I would also would like to provide, uh, give appreciation for our collaboration on climate change and internal displacement issues. Last but not the least, thank you to IOM for the invitation for me to join this panel. And I look forward to the discussions. Over to you. Thank you very much to you. I feel honored to have you on board and we should thank you much more than you thanking us. I think everything you touched upon, the coordinated approach, ensuring human rights and having participation is something we've strived for for years. And we always want to remember the value of culture and indigenous rights. I think 
everything you've said is very clear and very relevant. But I am marching on very quickly here because we have a tight panel. And the next speaker is General Ancien Nibaruto, Director General of Burundi Civil Protection and Chief Executive National Platform for Risk Prevention and Disaster Management. This is an intersectorial technical committee that coordinates emergency preparedness and response action in Burundi. He will bring important perspectives of how the Burundi government's long-term approach to reduce the number of people displaced due to the effects of natural disaster and climate just has gone. So over to you. Welcome, General. Merci, Madame la Présidente de cette session. Je suis le général de for passing me the floor. I uh, am the general director of uh, civil protection in Burundi and also president of the national platform for risk prevention and, cut and uh, disaster management in Burundi. I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to actually allow Burundi to present their efforts and their work on the ground to uh, really respond to the challenges we're now facing linked to displaced people after climate disasters. It's very important, I think, to uh, reiterate these actions in the context of uh, the rolling out of long-term programs. It's important to actually look at climate change as a key factor influencing our work, and many of the speakers so far have really underlined the links at play and the fact that there must really be an increased uh, attention placed on this now uh, within our international community and within our countries. We need to really coordinate our efforts to make sure that uh, we are really able to respond to the current challenges and to respond to the needs of those affected. To reduce the number of individuals being displaced, the government of Burundi has really been looking at uh, reducing risks as a national priority. We have therefore set up a platform, as I said, uh, the National Prevention for uh, Risk Prevention and uh, Disaster Management to really coordinate all our preparatory and resilience building actions. We want to create a real exchange dynamic within different sectors and different areas so that we can really make sure our actions are coordinated and to make sure we can really prepare ourselves to have the best response possible. I feel that uh, NGOs in Burundi have also been very important in terms of contributing to these efforts. We've uh, been able to actually integrate their ideas and their initiatives as part of this platform. There are lots of things going on on a community level and a provincial level in terms of uh, coordinated plans for community development that are taking into account these factors now. We have individuals working in each area now who are responsible to act for actually rolling out our plans. And it's important, I think, to reiterate the fact that we are very committed to disaster management now and to really ensuring that we can integrate uh, the various humanitarian players involved and the uh, different service providers that are also uh, being um, called upon in the context of these, uh, these structures. So we really need to make sure that we do uh, create an optimized uh, structure for our work to make sure our resources can be drawn upon in the best possible way and to ensure that we can actually have a national strategy for disaster reduction and disaster management. We are trying to align this with the Sendai framework and the 2018 and 20, sorry, 2018 and 20, uh, 22 plans. We have an organizational uh, plan uh, for civil society organizations. We're trying to really set up response bodies now in various areas of the country 
Um, and we have an operational centre and a public health centre set up now that uh, is really managing our response, particularly in the context of COVID-19. There's a lot of work, therefore, going on within this centre, and we're now thought of as a model centre on a regional level. We've been chosen as one of the East Africa member countries uh, as, uh, as, as the specific country to host this uh, centre. And so this is very significant for us when it comes to actually managing situations of crisis. Uh, it's also important, I think, to uh, look at contingency planning. We have now on a national level a contingency plan to look at preparing anticipatory responses to possible future needs. Our Prime Minister has really placed the emphasis on the importance of this kind of plan and we're really trying to align our efforts now to look at the major risks that we're facing now and that we may face in the future. We are coordinating a group working specifically on epidemics. Uh, we know specifically uh, with COVID-19 at the moment, but also uh, linked to Ebola. We're looking at how we can actually prepare, therefore, for possible future pandemic context. We feel that this is very important in terms of preventive work. We've been uh, creating links with the DRC uh, in this uh, for, for work on this subject as well. Floods is another area that we're really focusing on. We have tracked this as a specific factor linked to displacement. We have uh, floods in identified areas within our plains areas, uh, plains um, part of the country. And we really need to make sure that we have a national plan and that we're working on uh, this specific threat um, within the various areas involved. We are also working uh, on our communications efforts specifically with regard to crisis management. It's important to inform you all, I think, that since 2015, Burundi has been uh, really facing many extreme climate events that uh, have been uh, directly linked to increases in rainfall and have created a lot of displacement, uh, internal displacements within our country. It's important, therefore, to really work uh, within uh, our country uh, to, to face up to these uh, climatic events and uh, to work out how we can actually measure them in the future uh, to try to work on prevention. Between 2018 and 2019, more than 200,000 people were uh, tracked as displaced individuals within our country. Uh, so we have a displacement uh, tracking device now, and uh, the uh, IOM actually helped us roll this out. We're really able to use this now to try to quantify the number of people affected. So this was introduced in 2015, and we now have quite a lot of statistics that we've been able to collect with regard to people on the move within our country linked specifically to these climatic events. So we can uh, then draw the specific connections between social and political issues at play as well. Uh, Madam Chair, I would also like to just uh, underline the some of the aspects linked to uh, capacity building that we have been working on on a governmental level. These capacity building efforts have specifically targeted some of our institutions and structures that are at risk of disasters and also linked to tracking population movements. We've tried to really establish links with a mapping of risks and with an identification process that have act, has actually enabled us to, to target and to track uh, specific uh, areas that are at high risk. The idea is to really try to prepare, therefore, for planned risk and uh, to try to roll out this kind of program throughout 
our national territory. We're uh, looking at this mapping process as uh, a starting point for further work in terms of uh, rolling out various significant tools. The displacements we see at the moment are indeed linked to climate change. Uh, I think the figure is around 80%. So it's really a crucial link to emphasize within our country at the moment. We really are facing the effects of climate change and climate disasters. Within this capacity building context, we have developed training actions as well. We're rolling out in large training plans now for individuals involved in preventive activities and also those involved in actually setting up structures to respond to urgent needs. We're trying to promote food self-sufficiency as well, working with associations and uh, charitable organizations in order to really determine some priorities linked, for example, to our maize production. We've really seen some re adverse effects uh, of climate change on uh, farmers producing maize in particular, and we have now an association that we're working with specifically to target uh, these communities that have been uh, very seriously affected in terms of their own uh, food sufficiency. We've uh, also rolled out a uh, a tool to adapt our planning programs to uh, important climate effects within the sustainable development agenda. We have a 2018-2027 plan to try to reduce disaster risks and really place the emphasis on adaptation to climate change. We're developing a early warning system and uh, we really need to try to emphasize and uh, carry on with these activities through our national team that we've set up and through sharing data. The idea is to really be able to better manage the way in which we prepare for and also react to disasters. Disaster management is now being uh, rolled out and um, looked at as a transverse or cross-cutting issue. We're trying to involve, therefore, different governmental departments uh, at various levels and also those working on, on the ground. We have a national committee, therefore, uh, tasked specifically with um, looking at initiatives uh, linked to reproductive health and linked to health services uh, for, for migrants. We're looking at education as well as a specific priority. At the University of Burundi, we now have a master's level program linked to disaster management and disaster risk prevention. We've tried, therefore, to really integrate training courses on disaster mitigation within some of our top uh, teaching institutions. We're placing the emphasis on the importance of communication when it comes to risk prevention with our national network of communication and, inter and information on uh, disaster risk. We're looking also at research. Research and development is, of course, a, a key area. And uh, we are able now to draw on some cutting edge technology to help us with these efforts. We're promoting sectoral groups as well. So to try to actually link and bring together work on different areas, we have ministerial departments in charge of actually monitoring these with links to specific UN agencies involved. We also want to really try to bring in the private sector to support us in our work, uh, as well as the civil society. We have many challenges when it comes to actually establishing better uh, public-private partnerships. We have work to do, but we're going to really try to uh, place the emphasis on this and uh, continue to work in this way. To conclude now, I'd like to also just introduce another program that we are rolling out in terms of investment in disaster prevention. Last year, the government of Burundi created our own national fund for disaster risk prevention. Um, we are using this 
raise funds now um, through our partnerships with various organizations. Partnerships have been very important for us in terms of the projects that we actually have on the ground at the moment uh, to work on a community level on disaster prevention. Also, in terms of some of our institutional work on capacity building with, uh, with, with Oxfam, with Care International, with uh, Hygiene and other organizations. I think this was everything I wanted to share. I know I said quite a lot. I tried to cover everything, but I think I better leave the floor now to some of the other panelists. I'd be happy to answer your questions, of course, though. Thank you. Merci, General. Pardon, parce que je parle pas français, mais it is very impressive what Burundi is doing. Very comprehensive approach, and uh, I appreciate everything you do. You have the local. Uh, university involved, you are integrating in schools, you're working with IOM's DTM to get the facts. I am I'm highly impressed. I know very little about Burundi, but it is extremely interesting to hear all the work you're doing. And uh, I wish we had more time for every panelist to expand. But with no further ado, I have, I have uh, three more panelists and then we open up for questions. So from Colombia, we should have uh, Madame Farai Calier Gonzalez, who is uh, Director of Economy at the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She was previously Council of International Affairs at the Permanent Mission of Colombia to the United Nations. So, por favor, si la señora está, if you are here, please take Thank the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Moderator. And Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches para todos. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My regards to the distinguished panelists joining us today, and thank you to the IOM for inviting us to present our views on the relationship between migration, environment, and climate change, and its relation with humanitarian and uh, peace efforts. So first of all, I think that we should have better balance between mitigation and adaptation to climate change. There are those countries who are more responsible for the climate change that are doing less to adapt. It. And that's why when we talk about climate adaptation, we are talking of resilience, especially in those vulnerable kind of, uh, countries to climate change, such as Colombia, the protection of biodiversity and uh, environmental degradation, as well as uh, the effects of climate change affect countries in different ways and populations in different ways as well. What we are doing at a national level in our initiative that started in 2020, started developing adaptation plans designed for the entirety of our national territory, developing solutions that are proposed by the communities themselves when we talk about mitigating climate change. We are talking about capacity building initiatives related to economy, as well as the creation of structures that are resilient to climate change, including technology and food systems that are adequate to these initiatives. We hope that we will be able to uh, come to fruitful and hopeful partnerships in this regard during COP26 runs into our society. Well, thank you very much. I think Colombia has done a lot of interesting work as well. I've been asked now by the interpreters if we can speak a bit slower in, to ensure that they can um, follow the discussion. It's there's a lot of things we want to get out and there's a lot of people on the Q&A that want to open. So I will just launch in. We have two more speakers. So first, it's Mr. Andrew Harper, Special Advisor on Climate Action from UNHCR, who will talk about UNHCR's um, perspective on HDPN and how they work with their strategic framework for climate action. So, Mr. Harper, if you're online, over to you. Mm. Okay, no, no, thank you very much, Angelica, and 
Thank you. And, and then remember to speak rather slowly. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No. Thanks, Angelica, and thanks, IOM, and um, thank you to all the participants. The, I, I don't think I need to stress the challenges that the world is facing um, in relation to, to climate change and the, the evidence that exists in order to help us have a much more informed position on um, steps. That we need, that we all need to take in order to provide the necessary dignity, and in order to empower those people who are very much on the front lines of the climate emergency. However, I don't think it's sufficient for any of us just to look at the current situation, and and I would say that we're still not investing sufficiently in supporting adaptation and prevention. There's still a lot of talk about it, but as our friends, whether they be in the Philippines or Indonesia or Burundi or Colombia can attest, it's the, it's the people on the ground that we need to give them an option. We need to give them an option that they don't have to move in order to find a future. We have been working very closely with IOM and, and I'd like to particularly pay um, credit to Dina and her crew on the climate um, on the climate team there who have been very inclusive, uh, particularly in relation to how UNHCR and IOM have been working to address um, that very close link between uh, people being forced to move and people choosing to move. Um, and one of the key elements that we're increasingly seeing across the world is that trying to identify and to attribute the reason why people are moving is becoming increasingly fraught. And this is why it is important that agencies such as IOM and UNHCR and others continue to work very closely together. And for those governments who are also on this session to, to, today, whether they be donors or hosting states, I think some of the examples of where UNHCR and IOM working together uh, can provide a best practice. Because it's not only due to migration or to conflict that people are moving, we also need to also take into account some of the other mega trends. And whether that be urbanization, whether it be changes in livelihood, whether it be looking at massive population growth in, in certain countries, including in, in Africa, we're not going to be able to change um, the dynamics. People are going to move. The increase in global temperatures are going to continue to increase, and so we're going to have to adapt. What UNHCR is particularly trying to do, and working again with world leaders, uh, world leaders in, in particularly in trying to anticipate the future and, and looking at uh, the impact of climate is to see how we can identify where vulnerable groups exist at the moment, but where groups will be forced to move uh, in the future. Because where those vulnerabilities are enhanced, where those underlying grievances are not addressed, then conflict will potentially break out. And so we're trying to move from very much a reactive approach to a proactive approach and looking to work with key stakeholders, governments, uh, both the hosting governments as well as development actors to see whether we can uh, limit and mitigate conflict before it starts. And again, this is something which is much bigger than just um, one agency or one system. But we know what's going to be happening and so we need to be better prepared. So I would just like to, um, again, keep this relatively short because I, I know we've, there's been a lot going on already, uh, but to applaud IOM um, on its collaborative approach and the need for us to be focusing more on people where they are at the moment before they're forced to move. And I would also recognise the work of the Special Rapporteur and IDPs by saying that people are displaced internally before they cross the border. And it's up to us to determine whether we can provide the necessary assistance and protection 
where people are before they are forced to move further afield. So what the future holds is largely up to us to determine. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper. I truly believe that it's only as a one UN we can actually work together. So I appreciate you, your intervention, especially much here. The last speaker, not the least, is Mr. Ignacio Packer, the Executive Director from the International Council of Voluntary Agencies. He's going to highlight different issues around climate change and the humanitarian action. I think if you're online, with no further ado, I will hand over to you and then we will open for questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Angelica Broman. And, um, Really happy to be back on the uh, IDM and uh, really pleased to, to be able to speak on this uh, panel after uh, six really very interesting uh, contributions from Burundi, from Indonesia, from uh, Colombia, well documented. Uh, the special envoy for migration from the Netherlands, um, uh, Cecilia, of course, the special uh, uh, rapporteur on uh, human rights for internally displaced persons. And then now following uh, uh, Andrew from uh, UNHCR, I would cut short on some of the elements I, I was going to say and uh, um, uh, focus very much on um, and, and very, very focused on the, uh, the nexus uh, perspective even that it can bring me into a number of uh, of other directions. First, I would like to to say that um, uh, IGVA, being uh, the diverse global network of uh, humanitarian NGOs, so the operational footprint of the members is approximately twenty billion dollars. But it's the diversity which is also a strong added uh, value, including for the discussions around uh, policy at national, uh, regional and, uh, and global level. We just had our 18th uh, General Assembly last week and we have stepped up uh, the commitments and ambitions to meet the humanitarian protection challenges already being amplified by the climate and environment emergency and also to mitigate and prepare uh, for those to come. So we have a NIGVA 2030 strategy adopted uh, last, last week by the General Assembly, which presents transformations of which addressing the impact of climate change on humanitarian action is one of them. So the perspective of transformations in, of course, the way uh, we uh, uh, operate and the IGVA uh, General Assembly also adopted commitments and a motion to action on environment, climate and humanitarian action, which includes the uh, IGVA network signing on the Climate and Environment Charter for humanitarian organizations. Now, uh, just before uh, joining the uh, IDM, I moderated the closing uh, panel of IGVA's uh, annual conference which this year was on climate, environment, and humanitarian um, action. So what I would share uh, with you here also comes from some of the discussions that we have had around in the, the annual conference on the collaboration uh, or the collaborative action among member states, donors, multilateral organizations, uh, and the, re the need to work across humanitarian development, peace, climate nexus. So, and the five points, that I will be looking at are on collective action, on the focus on challenging environments, on locally led adaptation, on investments, and then one on prevention that I will make shorter, but I would insist, insist on it. And I hope for the interpreters that have a really long day and a difficult task that, the, that I'm speaking uh, slow enough, but at the same time, knowing that I have to go fast. <laughs> So on the collective action, we need to work together to strengthen our response from developing our knowledge and practice to influencing others. So they contribute to strengthen climate action in fragile and conflict affected places. We must address the humanitarian development and climate silos and human needs and aspirations are not categorized in these silos. People must be at the center of everything, everything we do, and we must focus on meeting the needs, rights, and aspirations of people. 
systems must be adapted to them and not the other way around. The second point is the focus on challenging environments. There has been work to date to bring together humanitarian and development actors to agree on collective outcomes. And we need now to agree on collective outcomes on climate resilience as a core part of the Nexus approaches. And uh, that has started in the Sahel, for instance, Sahel regions uh, severely impacted by land degradation, water scarcity and climate change, uh, where we see coordinated support for disaster preparedness and resilience across development and humanitarian funding. In an ideal world, the combined efforts of humanitarian development and peace actors in any given location would result in a comprehensive response that meets the immediate and long-term needs of individuals, communities and societies. In practice, well, in practice, the limited tolerance for risk of development actors often prevents them from fully engaging in areas most affected by armed conflicts. And climate risks and environmental degradation can further fuel intercommunal tensions and violence and shape dynamics of violence. The gap between the ideal world and what is in practice has led humanitarian organizations to engage in long-term programming to strengthen resilience, notably through livelihood support and water and sanitation activities. And there are limits to the abilities of uh, humanitarians to compensate for the comprehensive development that provides solid avenue for climate adaptation. There are places where humanitarians work, uh, where instability and fragility do not allow inclusive development efforts. Activities necessary to facilitate people's adaptation often beyond the scope of the capacities of humanitarian actors. We need to find ways collectively to ensure that gradual steps are taken to help reduce people's vulnerability, even in highly challenging environments. Otherwise, people will be left with no option but to move. The impacts of climate change are disproportionately experienced by people in vulnerable situations. That has been mentioned before and just want to insist of how it is important to have the great, to, to look at those with the greatest need of protection the internally displaced people, the refugees, the migrants in vulnerable situations, stateless less persons, um, including women, children, older persons, people with disabilities, LGBTQI plus people, indigenous peoples. The third point on locally led adaptation, we must address the past failures of inadequate humanitarian development investment in the communities. Principal partnerships among the local and international actors has to be in the forefront. The leadership, knowledge and capacities of the communities, local organizations and local authorities are to be generally respected and further empowered. More resources have to be directed to the communities at the local level, on community systems, on community infrastructure, whereby people can truly own the initiatives. This includes life-saving anticipatory action before a shock based on forecasts and risk analysis. We know this reduces the impacts of a disaster and reduces the humanitarian needs. Early May, a communique issued by the G7 said it welcomes the principles for locally led adaptation in reference to principles for locally led adaptation developed to help ensure that local communities are empowered to lead sustainable and effective adaptation to climate change at the local level. The United Kingdom and Irish governments, among uh, some of the governments, uh, leading global institutions and local and international NGOs have already endorsed these principles 
and are ad advocating their ind endorsement by others. This is encouraging, but of course, what counts is actions. Rapidly on investments, strengthening responses requires addressing critical gaps in climate finance. For now, despite the clear vulnerability of conflict affected communities, they are neglected by climate finance. The International Institute for Environment and Development Research indicates that less than 10% of global climate finance is dedicated to local action. It's even rarer for investment reaching the local level to be locally led. Stronger investment in climate adaptation through longer term, more systematic support to local actors to help strengthen resilience in fragile and conflict affected countries. And making it very short for prevention. We of course call for rebalancing our efforts to focus more on measures that can be taken to limit people's exposure and strengthening their resilience to risks while continue to respond to emergency needs. This includes promoting the rules of IHL, protecting the natural environment without which human life is impossible. These are key elements that have just come out from um, different organizations, different speakers from our discussions at our annual conference. And with this, I wish to thank IOM for the cooperation with civil society organizations on a broad range of migration issues at global, regional, national, and local levels. To Dina and the climate team, I express my appreciation for IOM's engagement for, 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 to sustain, uh, for sustained and mutually beneficial interaction with IGVA and its members that builds on synergies in policy and operational areas of migration for the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do appreciate, and I think all of the panelists have touched upon the importance of put, putting people at the center and work coordinated as the HDPN Nexus approach actually uh, advocates. We have now reached the end of the panel and we have a lot of people who want to intervene, but we're going to start with um, a person from Venezuela followed by Canada. So Mr. Antonio Morillo, General Director for Multilateral Affairs. If you're online, please take the floor now. Now I have the Canadian speaker whose name I, do, I lost here, sorry. It's, it's right Kilbert. on the screen, Angelica. <laughs> Tim Kilbert, it is, right? Yes, that's it. You got it. Thanks sorry so much. About that. No problem, Angelica. Thanks. Well, I'm um, you know, just delighted to be here. And I, I, I wanted to um, thank you for this, this amazing uh, conference uh, I've been following over the last couple of days. Um, as you know, Canada is an active member of the IOM, so we're really, really delighted that you've been at the forefront of the global response to climate-induced displacement and, and climate migration. Um, we also value the efforts of other international partners, the United Nations Refugee Agency and, and the Platform for Disaster Displacement uh, in, in looking at these topics in, you know, with such um, concern and, 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 and such uh, integrity. You know, um, Canada is a strong supporter uh, of the Global Compact for Migration. We're a champion country, so um, we really appreciate the efforts of the um, UN Network on Migration to ensure that climate migration will be an area of focus at the um, at the forum next year, the International Migration Review Forum. So, thank you to uh, all of you for your hard work. I won't talk about Canada uh, too much. We, we, you know. We don't have much time. Uh, we're already running over time, so I'll, I'll stop there. But just a big thank you uh, to everyone who's working so hard on this project. And I've really enjoyed all the interventions today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we appreciate the support that Canada has always given us. And um, I'm going to hand over to Deshan now because he has read who is on the list to speak. Are you there? 
presentation? Yes, I'm here. Basically, we have three more uh, uh, attendees that actually ask for the floor. We have uh, Madagascar, fo followed by Philippines, followed by Russian Federation. Uh, first, I think we need to give the floor to a representative of Madagascar, Lanto Rakhajarezifi, if I pronounce properly the family name. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, bonjour à tous. Uh, merci uh, uh, pour les panelistes pour uh, cette excellente. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations today. In Madagascar, we have already seen many complex migratory flows that have been directly linked to environmental issues. We have been able to map some of the effects on populations on the move, and particularly in the northwest of our country, we have really been able to link these to the rise in sea level, droughts, desertification and salinization as well as deforestation and uh, soil erosion. We have also felt the effects of cyclones and adverse weather events. It's important, therefore, to underline the uh, effects of climate change on migratory movements. We really are noting already significant effects on our local environments and ecosystems. In Madagascar, the population is moving from the south because they are having to uh, change their ways of life linked to their access to fertile land. These displace displacements contribute to economic difficulties that we're facing. And we have to look at this in terms of a workforce issue as well. We have a lot of economic activities that have a negative effect on our environment, particularly within our forest regions. We have important documentation now to really underline the significant level of internal migration as a key challenge for sustainable systems and also cohesion and peace within our country. We are cooperating with our neighboring countries to try to really uh, respond to cohabitation difficulties and interactions between different cultural groups. We are therefore trying to establish links with host communities and really support regions that are feeling the effects of migratory flows. We are, of course, also uh, very affected by COVID-19 at the moment. We have rolled out various uh, plans uh, within our country uh, in order to try to curb these effects. And we are seeing effects linked to our migratory mapping. We've seen a massive movement of people uh, from the south after a situation of drought and then uh, an increased pressure within the north of our country. It's important, therefore, to really track migratory routes, support migrants along uh, their whole trajectory and really look at the social level of what we can do when it comes to access to health and access to education. When it comes to migratory issues and uh, development within our country, we have a, an internal migratory observatory uh, now, and this is supported by the IOM. We've seen a lot of uh, international support for this development work, and uh, we really do uh, welcome this. Uh, we are continuing to work uh, on our research centers and our platform that has now been set up to really strengthen our capacity to analyze internal migration phenomena. We therefore are seeing a lot of uh, individuals involved in training efforts, uh, trying to roll out national and regional policies. Uh, we no longer have a general migration coordination in terms of training, but we're trying very much to roll this out at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, inspiring actually speech. And I uh, would like now to give the floor to representative of the Philippines of the Climate Commission of the Philippines, Mr. Alexis Lapiz. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, greet uh, everyone uh, Good evening, and uh, I'd like also to thank the uh, panelists for uh, sharing uh, 
insightful uh, uh, ideas on the topics. And uh, of course, uh, this event is very timely. And uh, considering the urgent uh, international discourse dissecting the interrelational and nexus between three interrelational issues, that is climate change, environmental degradation, and their impacts on migration. As such, in the Philippines, we believe that we should focus on the use of applicable management framework that places the elements in the right places, not forcing them to come together in a contrived nexus approach. In this case, we are dealing with defined elements that fall into the following categories. Drivers that generate the, the risk, the impact generators, and the impact recipients. To trace the risk resources all the way to manifested impacts, this risk management practice is of utmost importance because it does not only generate predictability in terms of the interactions of the various phenomena involved in this discourse, but it can systematically pin down responses from countries in a more predictable manner, not to mention cost efficiency and cost effectivity. So in this session, we track the humanitarian development and peace issues vis-a-vis -vis climate change, environment, and human-centric phenomenon like migration. And depending on how it fully manifests can be a negative or positive indicator of how the attendant risks are handled. As we have, uh, as we have consistently indicated, climate change and environmental degradation are physical drivers which generate risk that can translate to impacts, which may be translate intermediate or more permanent and long lasting. A humanitarian situation is normally the result of an unmanaged risk, hence the materialization of impacts in the nature of a disaster. A peace outcome is also a result normally transitioning from a conflict situation catalyzed by either physical or socioeconomic drivers to one of lasting peace and development or the generation again into a humanitarian crisis and or undevelopment. It is quite unclear, therefore, that physical drivers can catalyze socioeconomic outcomes which may be positive or negative depending on how the coronal risks are managed. But then again, the drivers can also be triggered by human actions. We would like to reiterate our strong recommendation to apply a systematic risk management framework in the management of these physical and socioeconomic risks, threatening our countries today. We are further recommending the take up of the probabilistic risk assessment, the result of which will, under will underpin our anticipatory adaptation and sustainable development aspiration towards lasting peace and avoiding temporary or permanent migration of affected population. On the, issuance of, on the issue of capacity building, which we think is key to the efficient implementation of effective risk management actions, we strongly recommend development of knowledge and competencies of all players on the conceptual notion, as well as the practical applications of the risk management approach. It is important that everyone involved in the comprehensive process level of on the, the, of on the basis as well, the use of more innovative risk management approaches, which will certainly need to evolve over time, considering also the changing nature of the hazards and their attendant risk. Madam Chair, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity for giving the Philippines the shared thinking on these issues. Thank you. Then I would like to uh, hand floor back uh, uh, to our moderator, uh, Angelica, to have the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes left. So every panelist, if they want, can give one last comment. For me, it's been a pleasure to sit through this and learn a lot from all of you. But I will start with Mr. Clarenbeck. Would you like to have some last words? Very short. Well, Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Angelica, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, participating in this discussion.
for me, the key message that I would like to repeat again is that climate change is a huge challenge, a huge risk in many ways, but climate adaptation can also be an opportunity, an opportunity to rebuild. If we do that in the proper way, by focusing on learning, by involving local actors, and by listening to women and youth and asking what they need, we can help build livelihoods, build resilience, and doing that also work on um, one of the key drivers and key root causes of forced migration and displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I like your, op you know, it's an opportunity. It's something positive. Miss Vendenitias, I can't, Grata, I can't pronounce your last name. Would you like to give a few words? Uh, thank you, Angelica. Please don't worry about my last name. It is also difficult for many Indonesians. So just thank everyone for a very enlightening uh, presentation. I just want like to reiterate some of my points. Of course, the first on the need to enhance domestic capabilities, both legal framework, institutional building, also ensuring adequate resources at the national and local level to improve our effort to address the, for example, climate-induced uh, regular movement of people. And second, it's also important to build a regional approach that is tailor-made to the situation of each respective region. And of course, the importance of multilateral governance uh, framework to assist state in identifying gaps and missing links. And of course, I would like again to raise the importance of uh, uphold and observe the principle of burdens and responsibilities sharing. So it's not just becoming another rhetoric. Um, I also would like to support a point made by uh, the UNSR on IDP, Ms. Jimenez de Mari, on the importance of having a human rights center approach on migration. Now we have, uh, we already have tools to build such a process at the national, regional, and international level. For example, the Convention on the Right of Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family. A lot of people forgot we have this convention. So it is therefore important for us to promote universal ratification of this convention. Another point is as a fellow archipelagic nation, I would like I think it's important to reiterate concern being raised by uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji yesterday that we need to pay more attention on refugees coming from small island states whose not only existent culture but also its sovereignty in jeopardy because in jeopardy because of uh, climate change. Now, most of our discussion on climate change induced uh, migration still very much focused on movement uh, on land. So I think it's important we take a uh, 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 issue on, on this uh, maritime aspect of, of migration. And facing the challenge on climate change, including its migration impact, I think we should think this as a part of one planet rather as an individual country. It's a, it's a work for everyone. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you very much. I do agree. We have one planet and one humanity. So UN Special Rapporteur, Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Damare, You've already said so many good and <laughs> profound words, but I'm giving you the floor again. Okay. Well, thanks again for the, for for this uh, opportunity. I just would like to reiterate by my my message that addressing the the internal displacement and migration in the context of climate change requires a holistic approach to the complexities and multi-causality of human mobility in this context it requires individual and joint action, but also it requires participation of the IDPs and the communities themselves. And so that's my first message again, but secondly, also to ensure that when we include internally displaced persons um, in decision in, 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 and have them participate in decisions affecting them, we're also very clear about the, the, the specific needs and vulnerabilities of these groups, but in any case to ensure that they are not only regarded as vulnerable, but actually as agents of change. And last but not the least, of course, in all these, as a matter of normative uh, principles, we naturally adopt a human rights-based approach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We do agree with everything you say. <laughs> and now I am once again impressed by General Nibaruto's if worse in Burundi, and I wish I could speak better French, but please, General, over to you. 
Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente, pour Thank me you very much. This is uh, Angelica Broman. I'll be very brief. First, I would like uh, here to promote the uh, um, early warning process and mechanisms. I believe that uh, that will be easier for the communities to be aware of the risks, coming risks. Then the second point is about the development of the risk culture. That will be very important with like training sessions, information sessions for the community. So the communities here again will be better prepared when it comes to emergencies and that will promote also a resilience of these communities. And that will be a kind of bridge for us between uh, humanitarian aid and development. And my last message, my last key message is about communication. Communication is essential when it comes to risk management, natural disasters. We need to be able to respond to emergencies and to do so we know better communication. So here again, communities know exactly what to expect before, during and after an emergency situation. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. Uh, Mr. Andrew Harper had to leave for another session, so I'm now handing over to Ignacio, if you are ready to take the floor. Yes, for sure. Thank you very much. So in, in addition to the five key messages, I would uh, bring another one, perhaps just to say that um, um, we have to turn things, some of the things in a more positive aspect. Climate action is good for peace. And, uh, and I think that also has to be brought into uh, the, the way uh, our narrative, but also the way we work within the communities. And we must certainly redouble our efforts in reducing the needs. Building back better has to be more ambitious. It has to be reducing the needs. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I think we've had... A amazing two hours. I wish we had longer because these are huge issues. But I think we are all agreeing that there are opportunities to building back better. There are opportunities, there are solutions. We are there. We can work together with an holistic approach, coordinating, using a humanitarian development and peace approach to enhance climate mitigation and adaptation including everyone in this process and have a participatory. I think there's enough work for all of us, so we don't have to fight about that. There will be a report from this event, and I think it's also recorded, so we can look at it again. With no further ado, I see we're a little bit over time, but I would like to thank everyone who's organized the event and everyone attending. And I wish we had more time, as I said, this is a huge issue. And we will continue working on it. IOM is very, very dedicated to work across the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus and to assist all of you in this endeavor. Deshan, would you like to have a last word before we close this session? Angelica, I, I just actually first wish to thank you for a brilliant moderation. I would like to thank you for the all panelists and all uh, participants that take the floor from the floor. And uh, I would like to welcome you for also tomorrow, uh, starting from 9, New York, 9 a.m. New York time or 3 p.m. Geneva time. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>